Ramanandam Ramasukadam Kevalam Yanamortim Tondwa Titam Kangana Sadrisham Tatumasya Dilaksham Ekam Nityam Vimalamachalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhava Titam Traguna Rahitam Sadgurum Tam Namami Narayanam Padma Bhavam Vashishtam Shaktim Chatat Putra Parasarancha Vyasam Sukam Gaurapadam Mahantam Govinda Yogin Ramatasya Shishyam Sri Shankaracharya Matasya Padma Padam Chahastamalakancha Shishyam Tam Totikam Vartika Karamanyan Asmad Gurum Shantatam Anatoshmi Vishwam Narpanadrishyam Anyanagari Tulyam Nijantargatam Pashyanatmani Mayaya Bhai Horevod Bhutam Yata Nidraya Yasakshat Kurute Prabodha Samaye Swatmanam Eva Dvayam Tasmai Shri Guru Murtaye Namahidam Shri Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Om Sarashiva Samarambam Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asmadacharya Paryantam Vande Guru Param Param Ishwaro Guratmeti Murti Beda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyapta Dehaya Dakshinamurtaye Namaha Sarvavedanta Siddhanta Gocharam Tamagocharam Govindam Paramanandam Sadgurum Pranatosmiham Om Shri Krishna Arjuna Somebody Okay Arjuna He had a doubt And uh, Krishna gave him this Great teaching. This is really the essence of the teaching right here, and the eth essence of the methodology. The class we had last night. That's one. If you get the video, uh, you should review that. But, uh, the whole we gave you the whole essence of the teaching in those verses four to seven, which is what uh, you have a higher and a lower nature. <laughs> Higher nature is consciousness, pure, limitless, non-dual, actionless, ordinary consciousness, awareness, existence. And you have a material nature. That's called your lower nature. Uh, your self, your true nature can't create because there's only from its point of view, from this, this standpoint, from the standpoint of your <coughs> true nature, there's nothing other than yourself, so how can you create? What's to create? So the self is free of creation. It's ajatavada. It's, it's unborn. So it never came, <coughs> never came into being and it never goes out. That's why you don't have to worry about dying because you weren't born. If you were born then you have to worry about dying but since you're not born that whole issue of die, death is not relevant to you. And the material part of yourself uh, can't create either because it's inert it's not conscious it's inert 
But when you mix consciousness and matter, then you get conscious beings, sentient beings. They're called jivas. There are all kinds of jivas from uh, bacteria up to the most complex uh, humans. And there's uh, jivas in other dimensions, call them angelic jivas, there's demonic jivas, there's all just infinite supply of jivas, individuals. They're all programs uh, created by Maya. Maya is what mixes, Maya mixes awareness with matter and creates this jiva. The jiva is a mixture of consciousness and matter. Maya mixes the two and therefore the jivas are confused. They don't know whether they're material entities or whether they're spiritual entities. Probably most of you in this room uh, believe that you're spiritual entities. So you're, that's probably why you're sitting here. People who think they're material entities are not interested in this teaching. <laughs> but, even though you're a spiritual person, uh, you will have a lot of confusions in your mind about who you are. You will superimpose your material nature on your spiritual nature and you'll superimpose your material, na your spiritual nature on your material nature. You'll confuse the two. We call that superimposition. Mutual superimposition. And the whole teaching, the whole teaching of Vedanta is to separate the material portion from the spiritual portion, the consciousness portion from the matter portion of yourself. It's, everybody's the same mixture. The, why, why would you want to do that? Because the spiritual portion, out of ignorance of its spiritual nature, identifies with the material portion. And, and it thinks that it's a body. Or, and what else does it think? That, that's what the, these earth, air, fire, water, and space, that, that represents your body. Nobody doubts that they're a tree. Does anybody uh, think they're a tree? No. Even though, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> But you often think you're the body, don't you? You often, you're very, you're very much in love with your body. Why aren't you as much in love with the tree? Your body has exactly the same status ontologically and existentially as the tree. It's just matter. So why are you so in love with your body? Why not just go hug a tree? See? That, that's why, because, yeah, Ehud? I want to ask a question about that, about the, the, the issue of ownership. Let's say you have a toothache, and you come to me and you say, I have a toothache. And I say, okay, that's, I'm sorry about that. But then, I have a toothache. That's much more serious to me. Yeah, because Even though they're supposedly on the same uh, order of reality, <coughs> but I'm much more concerned... Yeah, you're, you're, you're more identified with your upadi than you are my upadi. I don't have toothaches, because I, although my body has toothaches. I've had a lot of dental surgery since my open heart surgery. But I, I don't have toothaches. Why not? Because I'm pure consciousness. I don't have any teeth. But when you take yourself to be a jiva, you identify with the upadi that's closest to you. Wait, huh? 
So my feelings belong to my upadi and your feelings belong to your upadi, that's why. Because pe- that's a common doubt. People think that when they know that they're consciousness, then they should feel what everybody else is feeling. <clears throat> huh? Yeah. A lot of people get enlightened because they, hus- hus- wives particularly, women love to get enlightened so because they think they're going to be able to read their husbands' minds. <laughs> <laughs> And, and know what they're thinking, you know? <laughs> Just joking. Um, but wouldn't you like to know what every, everybody else thinks? No. <laughs> of course you Yeah, you do when you're attached to a person. When you're attached and, you're, and your happiness depends upon that other person, you definitely want to know what that other person's thinking. Hmm? Well, you can't know what that other person's thinking. Because the thoughts belong to your upadi, your thoughts belong to your upadi, and my thoughts belong to my upadi. And upadi means a limiting adjunct. A limiting adjunct is something that makes something look like something that it isn't. And I give you the example of the crystal and the red rose. You have a red rose and a, and a clear crystal. Now, if, if somebody comes up and says, oh, I see you have a red crystal, a, ro- a rose-colored crystal, a rose- rosy crystal, that's very unique. I've never seen such a crystal. Then I will say what? No, that's a clear crystal. You say, I'm sorry, that is a rose-colored crystal. That's a rose. That's a red crystal. Now, what is it? Is it a clear crystal or is it a red crystal? Well, it's both, isn't it? From the standpoint of the crystal itself, it's clear. But when you add the rose, huh, the crystal takes on the color of the rose. That's called an upadi. So you're clear. You're pure. Right? But when you add, huh, when you add a body, then what? You look like you're a body. When you add a mind, you look like you're a mind. And then that mind, what does that mind do? It makes you look like you're a feeling entity. When you add an intellect, it makes you look like you're a thinking entity. Understand? The thoughts, the feelings, and the qualities that you're experiencing in yourself don't belong to you. That's the point. They don't belong to the self. They don't belong to you, the self. <coughs> they belong to the upadi. The upadis are like clothing that you wear. There, huh? and they. When you look at yourself through those upadis, then what? The self looks like it's a thinking, feeling, walking, talking, happy, unhappy being, and so that's why you say, "I'm." unhappy, happy, I'm walking, I'm talking, I'm eating, I'm sleeping, I'm thirsty, etc., etc. You say that because you're looking at yourself through this upadi. In other words, your standpoint is what? The subtle body. Well, each subtle body, the the, the subtle body is one, because everybody has a subtle body, but the vasanas that have developed as a result of your exercise of free will over time have contaminated or polluted the subtle body so that what? When you look at the subtle, you look at yourself through the subtle body, through your mind, what? You think you're huh, sad, happy, pure, impure, intelligent, ignorant, whatever it is, according to your karma. That's what you think you are. You have the, 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 the subtle body needs to be purified of what? Of those vasana, that vasana pollution. Pollution, the pollution that you pick up is what? All the funny ideas you pick up from the world around you. That's called macrocosmic ignorance about who you are. And then those contaminate your subtle body. And then when you look at yourself, you don't see the self as it is. You see the self plus the 
quality, the attribute. The, at the self has no attributes. It's free of attributes. It has no qualities. It's near gunaha. It's always pure. It's always sparkling and clear. This is what we, this is what we call superimposition or ignorance. That, uh, so that's why you say, I, I'm sad. I is never sad. I is never happy. I never have a toothache. <laughs> but when you look at me through my body, then I have a toothache. So, so a, a, a jnani, an enlightened person, is a person who, who under, it understand. you can't physically separate the upadi, the instrument, from what? From the, the self. You can't separate them physically. There's no, remember we said there's no, there's no space between a mirror and its reflection, is there? There's no space. So you can't peel the reflection off the mirror. The reflection doesn't sit apart from the mirror a little bit physically apart, does it? The reflection appears in the mirror. But it's not identical with the mirror, is it? You can't physically pull it apart, but you can understand that what? The reflection is not the mirror. Understand, this is, this, is, this is called discrimination. There's no physical change going to take place here. Only in your understanding do you know that when you say, I'm sad, that sadness belongs to what? The mind, it doesn't belong to me. So jnanis talk like normal people, or they should. If they, don't, if they don't talk like normal people, they're probably not yanis. They're probably egos trying to impress other people with their spiritual attainment. So they say, I'm sad. Today I'm sad. Uh, speaking as the Upadi, I was sad the last couple months because my wife has been sick. She's, she's had some illness, we can't figure out what it is that's made her sick. And so that makes me sad because it's my wife. Right? Is that my wife? Now when I say my wife, I know she's not my wife. And when I say I'm sad, I know I'm not sad. I know that what? That ignorance is operating in in the, in the maya part of myself, in the mixture part of myself, and it's quite all right for that ignorance to operate there because I know what it is. So I don't feel sad when the upadi feels sad. It's just like the crystal, it, when you take, the, when you take the, the red rose away, what happens? The crystal's just the same. When you add the, 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 the red rose back, the crystal's still the same, isn't it? Om Purnamida, Purnamidam, Purnamida, Purnamida, Purnamidam, Purnam, Purnamudachate, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnamevavashishate. It says if you subtract the upadi, if you subtract this material part from the self, what? Self stays the same. It's always full. If you add what? If you add the se the material part of yourself back to the self, what? The self remains the same. So in the presence of your physical, or in the absence of your physical, what? You're still pure. You're still consciousness. That's what that mantra is. You all heard it. Purnami purnamida, purnamidam, purnat, purnamudachate, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnameva, Vashishyate. It's like that. We got Swamiji used to call it the mathematics of the Atman. <laughs> Subtract it, huh? 
it stays the same, add it, it stays the same. So whatever you think and feel belongs to what? The upadi belongs to your equipment, to one of these bodies or the five sheaths. It doesn't belong to you. And that's what moksha is. Moksha is simply a, a firm understanding, a firm conviction that none of that belongs to me. That, that all belongs to the upadi and not to me. This is why we, we say that you don't have to get knowledge and you don't have to get rid of ignorance. You just have to know what knowledge is and ignorance is. And you just have to recognize ignorance for what it is and knowledge for what it is. Knowledge is I am limitless awareness and ignorance is I am a limited entity. Those are the only two basic thoughts you have about yourself. Either you think you're a limited entity, which is ignorance, or you think you're a limitless entity, which is knowledge. And, and ignorance is believing <laughs> the, the yourself when you feel limited. And you feel limited all the time. How, how do we know that you feel limited all the time? How do we know that? Because you always want something. Because you say, I want. I want is a statement of lack. So you're saying the I is lacking, aren't you? If you if you have everything, you won't say I want anything, will you? <coughs> but you say, uh, the I doesn't lack anything, so how can it say I want? Well, this is how we know you believe, or I I don't want. That's a fear, ragas and dwayshas, or desires and fears. I don't want. Same problem, isn't it? You think you're limited. You think that what you have or what might you might have can limit you, <laughs> hurt you. These are fear-oriented people. Or that fear-oriented part of your mind that doesn't want something, doesn't like something. Well, those likes and dislikes, those fears and desires, they belong to the what? The ignorant material part of yourself, they don't belong to you. So that that's what the verse was saying, basically. That's a summary. And that's the essence of the teaching. Now, that's pretty simple, but it ain't easy to what? To separate those two parts until you're 100% convinced that you're what? The spiritual part, the aware awareness part. Not that awareness is a part, but in terms of what? In terms of our thinking, we have to come down with our identity. We have to shift our identity from what? From the material part of ourself to the spiritual part of ourself. And the sadhana, the spiritual practice in Vedanta, is simply that. Shifting the eye, moving the eye from the reflected material part of yourself to the pure spiritual part of yourself. And that takes time. Because why? I have a huge vasana, <coughs> a huge, 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 huge vasana for thinking I'm limited. Thinking I'm inadequate. Thinking I'm incomplete. That, that belief is so deep, stuck so deep in my mind that it's very difficult to accept myself as pure and perfect and whole. So. Then, Krishna's giving, now, now Krishna's going to give you a, a meditation to help you see the spiritual part of yourself in the material world. Because we live in a material world. A world of what? Material objects, of thoughts. Thoughts are matter. Feelings are matter. Remember, he's included your feelings and your thoughts as material. They are. They're just matter. They just change or move a little faster than 
in this kind of matter, but, but it's just material. They don't think, they're not conscious, they're inert. You, as I said yesterday, your feelings don't feel and your thoughts don't think. <laughs> Neither one of them. So he's going to give, give you a, a meditation to expand your understanding and your love of what? Of Ishwara. To look and see yourself in these various things. And so he said, it's a beautiful verse that's... Later on you're going to see, we'll get to that chapter later on, probably this evening, uh, w where he talks about uh, the glories of the Lord. It's the same idea as here. And uh, that is uh, what's called vibhutis, or special manifestations of consciousness. You don't generally see consciousness in, I don't know, in the carpet, do you? Uh, the, the carpet is consciousness. Remember when, when I told you, when I showed you, I proved to you that I was wearing a consciousness? You said, I'm, you, you said it was a shirt and I proved to you that I was wearing consciousness? Now, you don't, you don't normally look at a shirt and see, that, see it as consciousness, do you? You don't normally look at a carpet and think it's as consciousness, but a carpet is consciousness. A shirt is consciousness. My socks are consciousness. This tripod here in that camera is consciousness. There's not one thing that isn't consciousness. Why? Because reality is non-dual reality. So that consciousness means yourself. So the shirt is me, the carpet is me, the tripod is me, the ceiling is me, everything is me. But <laughs> Why can't I see that? In other words, huh? Why do I think that this shirt is not me? Well, because it's so ordinary. So you just discount it. So he's going to give you a uh, he's going to give you a an idea of how to see yourself in objects, and so to develop love for what for the objects. This is called bhakti. You see. The, the jiva, the jiva uses objects. The jiva doesn't love objects. This is a sad fact. All your <coughs> objects you use, <laughs> you don't necessarily love them. Even people that you say you love, you actually just use them, what, to make yourself feel happy. And if your vision is going to be truly non-dual, then you're going to have to expand your vision to include everything, which means you're going to have to love everything as yourself, because everything is yourself. Can you imagine what it's like if, if, if I see you as me? Will I, will I cheat you? I'll cheat you if you're not me. But if you're me, will I cheat you? No. Will I, I'll injure you if you're not me, but will I injure you if you're me? No, I won't, will I? I'll lie to you if you're not me, but huh? will I lie to you if you're me? No, I won't. So you, you can see the utility, see the value of what? Expanding your vision to include every object as yourself. Think about it. That's freedom. That love, that, uh, that understanding, that knowledge that everything is me, gives rise to this great love for what? everything as myself, and then what? I'm free of duality. I'm free of what? Pain and suffering. I have no conflicts anymore with anything because everything's me, and I love myself more than anything, don't I? <laughs> you don't love your... You don't love your wife for your wife's sake. You love your wife for your sake. And your husband doesn't love you for your sake. He will say that, of course. But he loves you because what? For his sake. You're there to make him happy and he's there to make you happy. And you both have got an agreement on that. Huh? You don't love somebody huh, for their own sake if that person makes you unhappy. <laughs> You're out of there.
maybe not physically but mentally you're out of there you don't your 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 attention which is just love love is willing attention love is free will it's, it's willingly what placing your attention which is your consciousness into an object so you won't do that if it's something other than yourself so the whole idea here is what everything's me and it takes a little time to like start to think this way but as soon as you start to think this way then your feelings will follow all your thoughts evolve out of your feelings the intellect's the subtler and the feelings are the grosser so the thought occurs here and then the feeling occurs here when you feel that you're limitless and non-dual huh, you feel great when you when you think you're Limited and inadequate, you feel rotten. It's as simple as that. So when, when I think you're separate from me, I feel what? Fear all the time. And when I know that you're not separate from me, I feel love all the time. So he says, here's what you do. Here, here's how you... It is how you're meant to look at things. And Krishna's giving you an, an example here of how to think, of how to see uh, the world. He said, I, I means, I means you, means consciousness, means awareness. He says, wait till it's so. I am the taste in water. I am the light in the moon and the sun. I am Om in all the Vedas. Om is the essence of the Vedas. I am sound in the sound in space. The, the essential quality of space is sound. And the vitality, that's called prana, I'm the vitality, the life in human beings. You look for the life force, not at the body. The life in them is what? He's saying that's where you identify me, consciousness. He said, I am the sweet fragrance in the earth. The, earth. the property of earth is what? Smell. Each element has a property and, and a, a particular property. And the property of space is what? Is sound. The property of earth is smell. And so on with the other elements. So he's saying, I'm the essence of that particular thing. That because of which a thing is not a thing. He could say, what's the essence of sugar? Sweet. If you take away the sweet, do you have sugar? Huh? If you have a, if you have a, a sugar cube and you take the sweetness away, is it sugar? No, it's something else. It's not sugar. Huh? What's the essence of, of, of fire? Heat or light. Heat and light. It has two properties. Heat and light. It's more complex, so it has heat and light. And sound also. And touch. It's, fires are quite a little more complicated. It has more uh, properties <clears throat> than space, let's say. And l less properties than Earth. So he's saying whatever is essential in something is what? Is what that's what I am. That's where you can see yourself. So in human beings, it's in the energy, the shakti, the light, the vibration, the energy. That's where the self is, huh? It's where you recognize the self. As soon as that shakti or that energy, that life goes out of a human being, you know, you may be hugging and kissing them one minute, but as soon as that shakti goes away, that energy and they drop dead, you're not hugging them and kissing them anymore. <laughs> Which means what? You don't love the body, you love the essence, you love the life that's in them. You love the self that's in them. It's not the body. You may want to rub the body and all that sort of thing. But huh, as soon as the life goes out, that body is what? You, you hold your nose and you stick it under the earth or you put it in the fire and you get rid of it. That's a fact. The worms start eating it. It's just food for worms. It's food for worms now. 
but there aren't enough, the life energies at least keeping the worms from eating you completely. So, huh? but as soon as the life energy goes out of there, then what? The worms eat it. So he's saying the essence of whatever it is, the essence of it is awareness. That because that, that's called your nature, the nature of it, the dharma of it, the nature. See. I am disciplined in an ascetic. These are your yogis who, who you know, stand on one foot. There's a guy in India, you know, it's like, standing on one foot with his arm in the air like this for like 40 years. <laughs> his hair is about that long and, and his nails are like that long. And where, where could a person get that kind of discipline? Uh, well, only from the self. O only that kind of, that kind of discipline can uh, come from something that's eternal. So that's, that's where he's getting it. Is from the self. That's where you see it in that person. See. And I'm the result of discipline. Know me as the eternal seed in all beings. Seed means what? That from which the form comes. That, huh? He said that's an eternal seed. That's not a seed that, that lives and dies. It's a seed that's eternal. It keeps producing forms forever and ever and ever. I am the capacity of discrimination in the intellect. Where you see a br bright person, you see a person who's really bright, brilliant, intelligent, that's the self. That sattva guna, uh, that sattva guna makes you intelligent. If you have a very, very powerful sattva, predominant sattva, you'll be very intelligent. Sa and the word sattva means what? This is called sat. And sattva is what? The closest material element to, huh? to sat, awareness. It's like pure prakriti or pure space. And so what? It confers intelligence on people. So wherever you see a brilliant person, there you see the Lord. Everybody's the Lord, obviously, but in, later on you, you're going to see when we get up to the, 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 the uh, 11th chapter, he's going to expand to include a lot of really awful things. But right now, Arjuna is still a little baby, spiritually. And uh, he just wants him to uh, look for what's exceptional and find, identify the self in what's exceptional in the creation. I am the capacity of discrimination in the intellect and the brilliance in a brilliant mind. Where you find a discriminating person, that's the self. Or a brilliant person, that's the self. There. I am the strength that is free from desire. Desire doesn't make you strong. Desire makes you weak. The more, the more you desire, the weaker you are. The less you desire, the stronger you are. Your desires sap your strength. They suck your energy. That's why they're always asking you to like, look at your desires and see if you need them. You look at our societies, how weak we become. How sick the people are. Sick with desire and tied to a dying animal, this body. And luxuries have become necessities. Huh? We, people can't live. Huh? Probably 80% of the things that we have are luxuries, totally unnecessary. And look at, did you ever wonder why the people are so weak and so sick and unhealthy and why the environment is so bad? Because people have become spiritually weak. Because their desires have, been, have sucked, the, sucked the power, the energy, the vitality out of them. What are you saying here? No, you, you never, you, you want to feel good? Stand up to your desires. You want to feel like somebody? Everybody wants to be powerful. 
You want to be powerful? Stand up to your desires. <coughs> You'll get powerful. You'll get very strong. So he's saying here, here, I am the strength that's free from desire and attachment. Desire and attachment is the same thing. I, in all, and now he's, he's in a beautiful verse. I love this. I, I embolden it in the text. And he said, in all beings I am the desire that is not opposed to Dharma. That's that pure desire that what? That keeps your karma stream going. Nothing wrong with that desire. That desire is yourself. As long as what? It doesn't get perverted. And what? Goes against your, your nature or against the rules that are operating in the Dharma field. The things and beings that come from Sattva, Rajas, and Thomas come from me alone. They are in me, but I am not in them. What does that mean? They are in me, but I am not in them. They depend upon me, but I don't depend upon them. Remember the hand. Does the, does the light depend upon the hand, or does the hand depend upon the light? The hand is in the light. The light is not in the hand. You take away the light, you can't see the hand. You take away the hand, the light still remains. The light's always here. When you put the hand, what? The hand reflects the light, so what? The light's there first, and then the what? The light, the hand is known when it appears in the light. So he's saying, all the objects are in you, but what? You're free of all the objects. He's telling you about your nature as consciousness. The entire human world is deluded by the modifications brought on by these three changing qualities. Sattva, Rajas, and Thomas. Consequently, this is, he said, this is why I'm not known apart from these qualities, these upadis, these objects. I'm the essence of the objects. Absolutely, objects completely depend upon me, but what? Because of these gunas, these three gunas, right, I don't know this. My projection, the gunas, is difficult to penetrate. Why is, why is this world so difficult to see through? And why is the self so hard to realize? Why? Because the self is dead boring to a... Huh? It's always the same, it's always present, and it doesn't change. <laughs> why is Maya so fascinating? Because it's new every second. It's colorful. It's dynamic. It's variegated. It has all sorts of forms and shapes and colors. It's exciting. And when I'm when I'm when I don't know who I am, I'm bored with myself. I want to be excited. I want to be interested. People often say it to me. I don't. They say you know, worldly people. They say. I tell them about the self, they say, why are you kidding? I said, oh, oh, that's all right, that's nice, that's all of these, it sounds very good, but I'll wait till I, after, at the end of my life I'll do it, or, or when I, next life, because right now I'm really interested in what's going on here. So please don't tell me about this self, okay? No, I hear it all the time, not interested. So what, this is what, that's why, that, those are the gunas. It's the gunas, the qualities that make this thing an exciting place. And so it's fascinating, it's like a film. You're always, always excited, what's going to happen next? Wow, huh? Is it going to be a scary movie? Or is it going to be a comedy? What's it going to be? Huh? You never know when you wake up in the morning what it's going to be. But when you wake up, and uh, Yanni wakes up in the morning, it's always the same. <gasps> Ho hum. <laughs> you know. No, it's not like that. <laughs> Even though it's always present and it's always the same, it's just pure bliss.
is just pure satisfaction. You're so satisfied that the little the little play of these little movements on the screen of your consciousness just doesn't do anything for you at all. It's humorous and amusing. But you could just as well switch it off. Huh? Just switch off the TV, it's fine. Because I'm so full in myself that who could care? And it's always the same play anyway, isn't it? Uh, it's always either a tragedy or comedy or something in between. <laughs> what does it matter? Huh? That's why, that's why you can't, that's why the self, you know, the self is reflected in the subtle body. That's why life, that's why you, that's a, you see life. When you take the subtle body away, remember when we're meditating and the subtle body was like still and then you could feel that presence, huh? that peace, that awareness where you're experiencing yourself? That's not exciting, is it? Huh? It's very satisfying up to a point, but if you have a lot of vasanas, you can't sit in meditation for very long. Why? Because your vasanas will distract you and say, Jesus, just feeling good like this, I want a little excitement, give me a little something. And so your vasana will kick in and off you'll go. And you'll leave, you'll leave that feeling of satisfaction and bliss that's always going on inside you. That feeling of satisfaction and bliss and wholeness it, we call it the waking aspect of the deep sleep state, uh, the, the sleep aspect of the waking state. You're very happy when you're asleep, aren't you? Why? Because you're not thinking about what you're experiencing, you're just experiencing it and it feels really good. But as soon as you wake up, what happens? Your mind starts thinking about it and what? You get fascinated by all this color and sound and light and fury and so forth and so on. And you don't realize life's but a passing shadow. A poor player that struts and frets its hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Shakespeare. <laughs> you don't... I, you don't realize, oh, you're fascinated, you run out. Oh, I want love, oh, I want sex, oh, I want pleasure. Oh, I want, what, excitement, I want travel, I want this, I want that, I want that. This, oh, I'm afraid of that, oh, my God, whatever. And you walk away from that total satisfaction. Brahmanandam paramasukadam, that second word in the chant, paramasuka means what? Total satisfaction. Because it's not exciting. Because the gunas, what do they do? They hide it. Behind this, uh, it's hidden behind this facade of excitement and attraction and novelty and so forth and so on. He said, and he says, how do you get, how do you get through that, that, how do you get through that guna veil? Only those who seek me can remove it. Huh? That means you, act, you actively have to do so. No, 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 I, I don't want to see. No, no thanks. Because my guru said, I'm not a doer. See? My guru said, you're not a doer, so I'm not going to seek. And then it will just happen by grace. That's why. So I'm waiting for grace. No. He says here, forget it. Grace is not going to happen. You've got to do the work. He said, only those who seek me can remove it. How are you going to seek? Shravana, manana, didyasana. First starting with karma yoga and then go through the steps. Karma yoga, vipassana yoga, shravana, manana, and nididyasana. Those are the five steps of self-realization, of enlightenment. You've got to go through them. It's no... No option, no other option. Oh no, I, it's too hard for me, it's too much. I don't want to do that. I'll just wait for grace. I'm not the doer. Yes. Uh, sorry, can you tell me about the source of these five steps? Because uh, 
some some Vedanta scholar told me a few months ago that uh, karma yoga isn't part of Shankara's teaching. Well, that's right. But that's okay, because Shankara deals with the Shravana, Manana, and Nididhyasana. But Vedanta is more than Shankara's teaching. Yeah. Vedanta is part of the Vedas. So, so the, but he talks about the Upasana Yoga. And, the, and he does, actually is part of the teaching, because when he analyzes the Upanishads, you find the Karma Yoga in there as well. But Shankar is known for what? Viveka, discrimination. And there, that's, that, that um, is Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. Shravana means hearing. Manana means what? Reflecting on what you've heard and discarding those beliefs and opinions that are not in, in harmony with what you've heard. And what? Nididhyasana is assimilating, removing the obstacles to what? the knowledge, so that you get the fruit of the knowledge. So, but this is the whole plan of the Gita. You can see the whole Gita here. The Gita includes all three of these. Those are the five steps. Uh, there's actually, uh, the steps have been broken down and been, been made a more, little more sophisticated in Panchadasi, in the chapters on direct uh, and indirect knowledge, chapters seven and eight. Uh, the stages of enlightenment are ex explained in there, but it boils down. He just added a couple at the end, but all of those are included here as well, in just different form. So he says, "You got to, you got to what? You got to do the work. This is not going to happen automatically." Uh, you know, the first six chapters were all about self-effort. Now the second six chapters, so what did we say? There to. Huh? to get Ishwara on our side, to see that Ishwara's got our back. Because just your own effort's not enough. You need to what? Elicit the help of Ishwara. That Ishwara means your life, your environment. You have to develop a loving, serving relationship with your environment, an appreciative relationship with your environment. So to neutralize your environment and get an objective view of what? of reality. In the first stage, people, like I said, the jiva just wants to use objects. The jiva doesn't want to love objects, or if it loves objects, it loves them to use them. But in the second stage, uh, we become objective, and the jiva starts to take into account what? Ishwara, his or her environment, the people, the situations, the society, Every, at the whole context in which the jiva exists, that has to be part of your understanding of yourself. When you're self-centered, you think everybody else is somebody else. <laughs> you don't realize that everybody else is you. There are no others. But you believe, oh, she's different from me. She's not me. He's not me. That's not me. Blah, blah, blah. That's how you feel. So now I have to, like, start including the, everything as a definition of myself, or I'm going to just stay, what, self-centered, egocentric, and I'm going to suffer. Because if you don't take your context into, into account and have a proper relationship with your context, you're just going to be an unhappy person. That's all. Ishwara doesn't care what you want. <laughs> you care what you want. Ishwara just delivers to you what 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 you deserve based upon your actions and your and your at, actions are based upon your attitudes and your attitudes based upon what your knowledge so if your knowledge is that everything's different from me and it's only here to serve me when in fact you're here to serve the situation as well you're here to get something but you're also here to give something then uh, if you don't have that understanding then you're just going to have conflicts and you're not going to what? You're not going to be happy. So, including Ishwara uh, and shifting your attention away from your 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 own little selfish egocentric self to the environment and looking at things objectively. Hmm? That's the point of these six chapters. 
then it's capable of understanding the, what the identity between Jiva and Ishwara. But until that, that stage has taken place, that identity is not going to happen. It's a process. It's a slow, gradual shift process away from the subjective option to the objective option and then back to the what, transcendental option. Then Ishwara and Jiva are both seen to be objects and what? Because I'm looking at Ishwara and Jiva from point of view of awareness. People, people want to like ignore Ishwara. Well, <laughs> good luck. They just want to go inside and, and start their Kundalini up and explode out and, and get up to here. Just ignore everything else. That's what they think they're going to do. Well, they're not. No, that doesn't work that way. And anyway, the Kundalini is Ishwara, so uh, good luck trying to figure that out and make that work for you. Or whatever. All these things. So, so that's the purpose here of this, of these teachings. This is called Upasana Yoga. Upasana. Karma Yoga is first. Karma Yoga is to get yourself cleared up. Get, get your, your emotional stuff processed. And then once you're, you're, you're not so damn emotional and self-centered, then it, what the next stage is to start to see yourself in the objects. <coughs> And what expand your vision of yourself beyond your own body to include uh, the objects that are appearing in you. And then the third stage is what? Jnana Yoga or Nididhyasana. That's, that's Tattvamasi, identifying yourself as awareness. We have to go through these stages. And he said, so, so you got to do the work. Undiscriminating people of limited capacity, deluded by my maya, become conditioned to negative behavior, revel in the pleasures of the senses, and consequently do not seek me. However, four types of good people come to me. It's going to analyze. This is just a checklist to see where you stand on the bhakti scale, okay? What kind of bhakti do you have? What kind of a bhakti devotee are you? There's no bhakti yoga, okay? <laughs> no such thing as bhakti yoga. Karma yoga and jnana yoga are bhakti yoga. Every endeavor that human beings do is motivated by bhakti. People who chase money have bhakti. Bill Gates has bhakti for money. He's devoted to money, or, or whatever. I don't know if he's devoted to money. He's got a lot of money. Bhakti is the coin of the realm. Bhakti is just awareness. It's just your own nature, your own love. <coughs> so everything, whether you, huh? So there's no bhakti yoga. <laughs> when you see bhakti yoga written in the Bhagavad Gita in chapter 12, it, it, the word bhakti yoga doesn't mean, the word Yoga doesn't mean, doesn't mean a technique or a practice. The word means a topic. If you'll notice at the bottom of every chapter in the Bhagavad Gita, it's, it's called a yoga. Arjuna Vishada Yoga. What kind of yoga is that? Getting miserable. That's the miserable yoga. This teaches you how to get miserable. No, that's not what yoga means. Yoga means the topic of what? Suffering. So bhakti yoga doesn't mean a special yoga, it means what? The topic of bhakti, the topic of your devotion, what you're devoted to, what you love. You guys, you guys love knowledge, that's why you're sitting here. You have the highest form of bhakti. Other people uh, have bhakti for various things, but people who are searching for enlightenment, they have bhakti for what? for the truth. And there's no bhakti, there's no devotion higher than the devotion to the truth. So don't let anybody tell you that, oh, you, you got to, your problem is, you know, you're not emotional, you're not, you don't love God and all that sort of stuff. It's nonsense. 
Disciplining your mind it takes the greatest amount of love. Seeking the self takes the greatest amount of love. You have to be completely committed. And he's going to he's going to point this out here. He says, however, four types of people seek me. The distressed. This, this that's generally when you start, isn't it? When you're suffering. You don't care about Bhagavan. <laughs> you care about getting rid of your suffering, and so therefore you think I better ask God to help out. That's most most everybody starts there. And then what? Those seeking security and pleasure. Hmm? These are people. the The karma kanda of the Veda is for those people. That's all the ritualism that's going to get you the stuff in the material world. That's what the karma kanda, the Veda, is about. About getting kama, arta, kama, arta, and so forth. Security and pleasure. And it tells you, you live this kind of life and you'll get secure and pleasure. You'll get security and you'll feel good. So those people. So they worship God to get God's stuff. Okay? Some worship God just to what? Get free of pain. Others worship God to get a good job, a good house, get their braces for their kids' teeth, huh? get their, their son into college, get a new car, get what? Get a relationship. How many times have you prayed for a relationship? Please, Lord, I want somebody that loves me. I want a little love. I want to love somebody. Means what? You're, you're searching pleasure. You just, huh? That's all. You want to feel good. So you beg God, oh, please, God, Give me a relationship. I want love. Or, oh, I'm in a real financial pickle. I need help, Lord. If you give me a good, if you make me win the lottery, I'll build a church for you. Business, you know. Making business with God. So that's a kind of bhakti. It's okay. <laughs> but, uh, see the motivation. Huh? Then he says what? And those who want to know me, that's the geni those are called geniasus. These are people who don't care about security, and these are sannyasis, and people who don't care about security and pleasure, and they're not in pain and suffering. They're just curious and they want to know. What the hell am I doing here? What's this about? This is an amazing place. This is so I want to understand this. And then what? And then the yanis. Those are people who love me because they have no choice. Because <laughs> it's the, the self is me. They have non-dual love. They see no separation between themselves and everything. So those are the four classes of devotees. Where where do you stand on this on this scale? And he says, among them, of those four. The one with non-dual devotion who knows me as I am is always united with me. That's called parama prema swarupaha, non-dual, uh, unconditional non-dual love. There's never a moment when you don't love yourself. Huh? That's the goal, is to always love yourself. And and that's huh. That's easy to do when you know who you are. And it's not when you don't. Because if you don't, because you are what? You're the only thing that's worthy of love. You're so beautiful. You are so beautiful. You're so luminous. You're so full. You're so perfect. But when you know who you are, you're just hopelessly in love with yourself. It's just it's, it's not an ego thing either. Huh? It's just pure knowledge because you're so beautiful. You know this. If you don't know who you are, then you think, oh, there's something wrong with me. I need to be different. If I'm different, then if I'm better or different, then maybe I'm love. Maybe I can love myself. I'm selfish. I can't love myself. I'm selfish. I mean. No, you can love yourself when you're mean. You can love yourself when you're selfish. Because no? yourself is beyond all those qualities. 
but you identify with these qualities and then you can't love yourself. The qualities belong to what? To Maya. They don't belong to you. You identify with the quality and then you say, I'm not lovable. I get angry. I can't love myself. I get angry. I'm not supposed to have any anger. <coughs> you don't have anger. You're free of anger. Anger happens when one of your desires is obstructed. It's just a mechanical thing. A desire rises and obstruction comes and anger comes. It has nothing to do with you. You're beautiful even when you're angry. Understand? We unconditionally love each other means what? Self loves the jiva and the jiva loves the self. means there's no difference. All, all of these people are good. They're all good. Why? Because they're at least they're, even the, even the ones that are just, you know, using Bhagawan to get Bhagawan stuff, huh? even those people are, they're all good. Because at least they're conscious of Bhagawan. That's the important point. That's the issue here. Right? But, what has he said? But the one who knows me is me. That's the, the best class. The best class, those yanis who know. Because it uh, means what? The self loves the self. End of story. With a mind absorbed in me, he or she reaches me. The end beyond which there is no other end. When you know yourself, your seeking stops. <laughs> Be surprised how many people, it, you know, write us and tell us that this teaching has, has uh, stopped their seeking. It does. When you see how beautiful you are, and you understand that there's nothing to get here, your seeking stops. Just, hey, you've understood. There's nothing to gain. There's nothing. There's nowhere to go. You're you're okay. You're fine. And the seeking stops. That's what he's saying. At the end of many births, a births here just means many experiences and thoughts. Don't, don't think, oh no, I've got to endure endless numbers of lifetimes before I ever get there. That's all bullshit. There's, there's no endless numbers of lifetimes. There's one lifetime in which you have millions of thoughts and feelings. And if you have to go through all those feelings and thoughts yeah, until you get there, that's all right. But you can get there very fast huh? simply by understanding that you're okay. Irrespective of what you think and feel, you're okay. You're perfect. Purnami dham means what? This is perfect. That is per. This means the jiva. What I see, this thing in front of me. Purna means perfect, full, I'm complete. That is perfect. It means Ishwar is perfect. Everything is fine. The end of many births, the one with self not reaches me by knowing that I am everything. Such wise people are very rare. Mm -hmm.